Every patient who gets diagnosed with breast cancer, regardless of stage, needs a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, that being said, we sort of tailor the approach to individual patient. Some patients do feel overwhelmed when they come in and meet three different specialists, each focusing on treatment that might not be in the immediate future. So we do a good job of trying to sort out um, which patient would benefit from which approach, and we offer a combination of both. So for the patient who is what we, if I may call so, garden variety DCIS or non-invasive breast cancer, we know that there is a limited role for systemic treatment, and so these patients really don't need to meet the medical oncologist up front. In fact, the medical oncologist probably would be able to give them a better consultation once they have the results from surgery, as well as detailed information on what we call biomarkers, meaning are they estrogen positive, are they progesterone positive? And so we generally tend to see these patients one-on-one. -on -one. Um, our whole plan is to try and get the patients to be seen within a 24 to 48 hour period. Because when you hear the news that you have been diagnosed with breast cancer, you're panicking. And we prefer to get those women in as quickly as possible, sit them down and sort of lay out the whole plan for them. And then we might bring them back a second time to come meet the individual specialists if we think they're ready for them. Or we might just get the surgery done and have them come back and see the radiation doctors and the medical oncologists. Um, there are certain women that present with cancers where we need a team approach right from the start. And we do offer the multidisciplinary clinic um, at least two, two days a week on Wednesdays and Fridays at our breast center. And most of these women are women that need um, a, um, you know, input from radiation or medical oncology right from the start. Some of these women go on to start chemotherapy as their first treatment and put surgery, you know, um, at a later stage. So those are decisions we make with input from the rest of the members of the team. Most women are eligible. We do look at stuff like family history. And if you have a strong family history, um, even after testing negative for the known mutations, if that person simply says, you know, there's something in my family. My mom had this, two of my sisters have it. You haven't just found what is wrong in my family. I want a double mastectomy. That's something we take into consideration. Obviously, if they have a known mutation, for example, if they have a mutation such as the BRCA mutation, one or two, we know that these are at a very high risk of forming um, the first cancer and a 30 to 40 percent chance of forming a second brand new cancer on the other side in the short, you know, future. Um, and so these are women, if they're young, uh, we do try to tell them, you know, this other breast that's intact um, is going to be exposed to the same factors that cause this cancer on the same side, on the side you are presenting with. And maybe long term, um, getting both of the breasts removed might be the best option. And again, it's a discussion to be had. Not everybody with the BRCA gene needs a double mastectomy. It's a choice women have to make. So genetic testing is a field where the science had just the science has just exploded, but our clinical knowledge still lags behind, which puts clinicians at a very difficult place because we test them for up to a panel of 25 different genes, and we do identify mutations, but we really do not know the clinical significance of each mutation that we find. For example, we know of BRCA1 and 2, and we know that historically, looking at families that have these kind of deleterious mutations have a lifetime risk of 85 to 87% of forming breast cancer by the time they're 80 years old or more. Now, recent studies show that these might be overestimates, but nonetheless, that is generally the number we quote them, and we tell them they're very high risk. There are certain other mutations that we know have a risk, but we are not quite sure how high, and is it enough to warrant a bilateral mastectomy? Examples of those kind of mutations are like the CHECK2 mutation or something called the ATM mutation. And we pick this up because the, the way of doing genetic testing has significantly improved at a fraction of a cost, 
And so it's easy almost to do the whole panel testing because, you know, patients who have a strong family history might not have the BRCA1 or 2, and we might find these unusual genes. We still cannot say this is what caused the cancer without doing further testing and longer follow-up. But we are running into situations like these where we are finding um, genetic mutations that we're not quite sure how to handle. We would offer preventative surgery as an option only in the highly motivated women, women who have understood that they have a chance for having surveillance, um, you know, being, being carefully watched with mammograms. In this subgroup of women who carry genetic mutations, MRI also is very important in following the breast. So we give them the option of ongoing active surveillance, which involves mammograms and MRIs and clinical exams, or just preventative mastectomies. Um, we, um, we decide on what is most suitable for the patient at a time that patient is very comfortable. Generally speaking, by the time I see the patient um, and we make a decision as to which route we suits the patients the best, they've seen the genetic counselors, they've seen the plastic surgeons and discussed all the reconstructive options, and they've talked to their families about logistics and help that they can get, because these reconstructive surgeries, it's a good six to eight weeks of recovery, and uh, some women prefer to do it in the summer when the kids are off and they're not running around as much, and so the first thing I tell them is they have time to plan this out. It's not like they're facing a diagnosis of cancer and have to act immediately. It's a very elective procedure. I think most women that we see have just heard the diagnosis and are in a state of panic. Um, and they want the first doctor to do the, the immediate surgery that you could possibly have done the very next day. And so the first thing to reassure them is breast cancer is not a disease that spreads like wildfire. They have time to make a fully informed decision. And if that involves getting multiple opinions or going to multidisciplinary clinics and being reassured that everybody is on the same page, that's the time they need to take because the decisions they make are going to affect them lifelong. So we don't want them to rush into making any decisions, especially emotional decisions such as getting a double mastectomy and then regretting it afterwards. So they really need to put a whole lot of, um, first of all, they need to understand their choices and then understand what suits them the best. I, in fact, actually make them consider writing out what matters to them, saying, if I do a mastectomy, I don't have to get a mammogram, I don't have to worry about um, getting MRIs. Uh, again, we, we reassure them that a mastectomy is a reasonable choice, but we also have to state to them that a mastectomy doesn't guarantee you a 0% recurrence. Cancer can come back on the chest wall even after a mastectomy. So it's not a you know, get out of jail card for breast cancer treatment. I think the one advice I have for women is, you know, um, make a list of what matters to you the most because that's what it comes down to. If I um, ask my patients, I say, you know, you have a disease that can be cured in 10 different ways. Um, and I'm going to make a recommendation based on your preferences and your fear and your concern. And if she says, you know, I, I want to be done with as effective treatment as possible with the least amount of morbidity. I know I'm trying to look at, you know, breast conserving surgeries and these are all effective treatments. And that's what I try to explain to patients saying, you're not choosing an inferior treatment just because you want to save your breast. If done right, these outcomes are exactly similar. So you decide whether you would want to have breast conserving surgery and have a mammogram every year and be reassured everything is okay or you know, women, more and more women, I think fear is the most, um, fa is one of the most important factors that drive women to get a double mastectomy for cancer that can be very easily treated with a lumpectomy. So we try to reassure them and try to address that aspect of their concern. 
Um, women wrongly think that a double mastectomy is going to prevent recurrence happening in the rest of their body, and that's simply not true. 